Okay, so this message today, this message today is a little bit about me, and it's a little bit about you. So we're missing a few here due to sickness, but we're going to make sure that they get the message too. And, uh, and we're going to send this message out. So whoever you are that hears this message, uh, God's going to do something for someone uh, through this message. This message is dear to my heart because it has to do with personal miracles. And uh, we're going to be talking about one found in John chapter 9 today. John chapter 9. So I just want to start off by saying this to you. I never asked to be here. Right here. I never asked to give a message. I never asked to give a sermon. I didn't walk through the doors back there of this church and think, I'm going to stand right here someday and talk to people about Jesus. I didn't ask for it. Because I know who and what I am. And my confidence of being special or important to God was shattered shattered years ago. I know everything that I have done some unacceptable and displeasing things. Sometimes I am filled with shame knowing that the God of my childhood disappointed in me for so long. Sometimes God creates a chain of events in our lives until we are face to face with Him. I am completely bewildered as to how God reached out to me and chooses to use me. I am humbled by God and by the Holy Spirit that I feel when I come here. I never asked for it. When Pastor Ron was with us, Pastor Ron told me, Stephen, when God talks to you, you better listen. I can't make you listen. God's going to do the talking. Amen. And don't tell me about the world about being lost or hurt. Thinking in your mind that if you're going to impress anyone about God, you have to know more than they do. You got to be smarter to testify. Some of us think we have to have all the answers before God uses us. I know I'm not alone in this. If you're here or if you're watching, it's because you know that God is real. And that God is somehow involved. Maybe you're trying to just figure it all out. I don't know. There is something about John chapter 9 that's going to touch your hearts today. So the title of this message, sir, is All I Know is that I was blind and now I see. All I know, all I know is that I was blind, but now I see. There are 41 
on the verses in the chapter of John that we're going to look into, chapter 9. The whole chapter is about this one story. Jesus heals a man that is born blind. The whole chapter is about him, and I don't even know his name. The Bible doesn't say. His family must have been kind of well known in the city because of what we're going to read about in the account. You know, Jesus performed other miracles also. Jesus had healed a, a man named Bartimaeus, which is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's, he's recorded healing two blind beggars near Jericho, and that's also told in the books of Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Then there's a healing of a blind man in, Be man in Bethsaida. When once he was healed, saw people. You remember that? He saw people that looked like trees after Jesus' miracle. Only Mark told that story. That incident. But today we're going to read a incident, a miraculous incident recorded only by John. This is the only gospel account that records that story. Dear God, as we approach you with this message, we pray that your spirit will be with us. Humbly I approach you as I present this information from you so that you take over with this message and that your spirit does a miracle in someone's heart. And know, dear God, that I'm just a vessel. I didn't ask to be here. You put opportunities in front of me, God, and I hope that you will use these this energy and, and my effort, you put words into this message to reach someone. Humbly, we approach you today, dear God, and we leave this message in your care, in Jesus' name. Amen. A little review about where we're at in John. Where are we at? Well, Jesus had already began teaching and preaching, declaring the good news of heaven had arrived. He had already turned water into wine. He told the woman at the well that he was the Christ. He healed an official son. He healed a paralyzed man by the pool. He fed 5,000 people miraculously. He walked on water. He rescued the woman caught in adultery. We've talked about some of those things together in past messages. The Pharisees were so caught up in their teachings that they refused to accept Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of Man, even focusing on the claim that they were followers of Moses because they knew that God had spoke to him, who was this Jesus, they claimed. Jesus was so close to them. He was in their midst, but they were blind. They couldn't see it. In fact, they were worked up at Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. So much so that Jesus barely escaped being stoned to death. So let's read about the incident and we're going to draw we're going to draw some lessons for us today. John chapter 9 and verse 1, this is what happens. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming. When no one can work, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. There's a few 
few things that we learned in the beginning of this incident. In the record of this account, did you notice that the blind man didn't appear to approach Jesus? I thought it was interesting. He didn't seek Jesus out. The Bible doesn't say that he went miles to find Jesus for healing. No, the Bible says that Jesus saw the man and then his disciples approached him with a question. Why did this happen? Well, the incident says because so that the works of God can be displayed in him, this blind man. The disciples really, uh, as they were walking together, Jesus looks up and probably sees the blind man. I want you to think in your mind. Jesus sees the blind man and these followers, these disciples are watching Jesus close. And they see Jesus glance towards the man. So then the disciples start asking him questions. And Jesus answers their questions. And really the disciples focus on that man and gets Jesus really involved. In fact, then Jesus says, He says, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. What, what was it that happened? What was it? It was a miracle. It happened so that so that the works of God could be displayed to him. In that moment, Jesus answered their question, which is really important for us today to also, indicating that sickness is not a sign of imperfection or, or sin, say sin. We know that we all inherited uh, sin and death, and with that, element, elements in our perfect flesh. But Jesus was making a point here when the disciples asked him a question. And then, Jesus performed a miracle in his case. He answered their questions, and the man was healed, which displayed the works of God. So have you ever seen this happen? Before we continue, I just want to say that, uh, have you ever seen this happen? Where someone that you know, or in the church, prays for someone that needs help. They're really bringing attention to them, just like the disciples did with with the blind man. And then, and then Jesus really got involved and did a healing. We've seen that in the case many times. Many times as we pray for others that need help. As we bring this attention to Jesus and leave it in his hands often, we see great transformations and healings in people's lives. Maybe uh, we've asked God to intervene and help in their case. God can answer and get involved. This happens so that God's works are displayed in, in his life. And before you know it, there are miraculous changes in their lives as God gets involved. As this event begins to bring glory to God, I want you to notice what happens in the community. Now for us today, if we ever seen anything like that happening, we'd be believers. No. It'd be fairly convincing, wouldn't it? But continuing on in verse 8, let's continue to read and see what happens in the community after this event. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, yeah, I am the man. How are your eyes open, they asked him. So he said, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He 
told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. I don't know. They were in disbelief. So they started right away asking questions. And he began telling them what he knew. He started telling them what Jesus did. But then they asked him, Where is he? And he said, I don't know. He really just wanted to share the miracle. That's it. He wanted to tell him the miracle. And they started asking him all kinds of questions. And he said, I, I don't know. They were caught up in looking for so many answers. So they took him to the Pharisees. Notice verse 13. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Keep in mind, brothers, that there was to be no work done on the Sabbath. And Jesus had a way of really stirring up the waters. Something he could have done on Monday, he decided to do on the Sabbath. Therefore, in verse 15, therefore the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight. Remember, the Pharisees were the religious leaders and those smart people who seemed to have all the answers and studied the Mosaic Law. The man answers them and says, He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So, they were divided. Then, they turned again to the blind man. What did you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, He is a prophet. Well, they still didn't believe, according to verse 18, that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? So now they got the parents involved with a bunch of questions. And the parents say, we know he's our son. And we know he was born blind. But how can he see now? Who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would put them out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Interesting. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man was a sinner. How was he born? Where is Jesus? Is he a prophet? Is this the Sabbath important? What do you have to say about him? Why is it that we feel we have to know everything? Why is it that in our minds we feel we have to know everything there is to know? 
men have a hard time asking for directions. So we think we know. Children have a hard time asking their parents. <laughs> Professors to their students think they know so much more. Bosses to employers. I'm not saying that the quest for knowledge is bad. But some of us are missing the miracle. Some of us are missing the miracle. So because we don't have all the answers, we keep quiet. We don't share the miracle. What if they ask things that I don't know? I don't know. I don't know. All I know is I was blind. And now I see. All I know is I was blind. But now I see. Notice verse 25. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I don't know. All I know is, I was blind, and now I see. Who is he? Jesus said, I'm that. I'm, I am. 
I am the Son of Man. I came so that the blind will see and those who will see become blind. Verse 35, Jesus heard that he had thrown him out. So when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he? Who is he, sir? Tell me so I can believe him. And Jesus said, You've seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. For judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see, and those who we become who see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this. They said, What are we blind to? So proud. Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. He exposed them as really being blind even though they claim they can see. Okay, brothers. You ready for this? The blind man in John chapter 9 knew very little about Jesus. We do know that he did feel in verse 17 that he was a prophet after what had happened. But he knew very little about it. He didn't have all the answers. No. The Pharisees and the community grilled this man and he said, I don't know. All I know is I was blind. And now I can see. Why do people, why do bad things happen to good people? What about science? What about historical evidence? What about other gods? What does this religion teach about this or that? What does this mean? What does that mean? How do you explain this? How do you explain that? I don't know. When I grew up, I was taught that I was taught what was right and what was wrong. But I was never good enough. I failed to experience the relationship that the Creator wants to have with me. Get ready for this because I know God's going to talk to I knew about Jesus. But I didn't know because I was blind. From everything I thought I knew. I thought I knew. How about you? Are we in a wrecked place in my life filled with empty living? A man. that I hardly really knew said to me, you should come to church on Sunday. So I did. And if I'm emotional, it's not because I'm sad. So I did go to church. On September 14th, 2014, I sat back in the back of a church with this group of men. Oddly, halfway through this program service, the group got up and left. All of them. And 
then I was alone. In the back of the church by myself. I broke down in tears that day. And I was overwhelmed by God's spirit. And I cried. And I accepted Jesus in my life. I felt his spirit like a blanket come over me. So warm. And I knew that no matter what I wanted. He would have to be first in my life. And then I had to listen to him. And then I wanted this Holy Spirit forever. And I started singing. I started seeing an unseen hand in my life. One day, I was having it so rough, I found myself sitting in a chair with the lights off, wondering how I was going to keep the lights on. And I start praying to God. And I remember saying, God, where are you? I don't know what I'm going to do. At that time, I, I had a stepdaughter still living with me. and I couldn't provide. She walked in the room and she said, Are you crying? I said, no. Just trying to figure things out. And she said to me, God is going to take care of it. Don't worry about it. Well, I was still worried about it. <laughs> so I left the house. I drove about two blocks away and I pulled over and I cried. While I was crying, the phone rang. I want to tell you this story because it was a miraculous moment for me. It was her grandmother, not my mom. Remember, she was a stepchild I was taking care of. She wasn't my mother, and miraculously, I hadn't talked to her for so long, and she called on the phone at that moment. And the first thing that she said to me was this. Stephen, how, how are you doing? And I said, I'm okay. She said, listen. With you taking care of her, I was just thinking. you got to need help once in a while with bills and stuff. Why do you say that? <laughs> Not only did the lights get turned on, but the water was safe too that day. How do you feel about women pastors? Do you need to be fully emerged during a water baptism? Who's King James anyway? Why did God choose Israel? What's the age of accountability? in heaven? What is the trinity? Are there three in one? What do angels do? What do demons really look like? I don't know. All I know is that September 14, 2014, when I accepted Jesus in my life, things started to change for me. That's my miracle. All I know is, I was blind, now I can see. After I graduated from business school to find it, I wanted to find a job. I didn't know what I was 
going to do what I worked so hard and I prayed to God to help me and the day I graduated I got a job offer. When I prayed God for a partner that would be good for me I found her. Soon after we started dating, she explained that her mother had cancer. She only had so long to live. So my girlfriend made it clear we'd be taking her to church. So God moved me to another church. And so we started going to church every Sunday with her and her mother and her sister and family. And it just wasn't like the church I was used to. But I just kept going. God said, just don't stop going. Just keep going. I heard him telling me I needed to be here. And then Pastor, our Pastor Ron, who we miss dearly, approached me and he said to me, Stephen, you need to listen to God. He's trying to talk to you. He said he wants something from you. He's talking to you. But he said, I can't tell you what it is. But I know what it is. Like, man, would you just tell me what it is? <laughs> so I started praying about it. And I went back to the pastor and I said, Pastor, how do you know when God is talking to you? He said, you know, You'll know it. Where are the dinosaurs in the Bible? What's your view? A predestination. What's the difference between a first Baptist and a second Baptist? What's a Pentecostal? What's a Seventh-day Adventist? Why do you do it this way and others do it that way? I don't know. All I know is when I brought Jesus into my life, everything changed. Are you missing the miracle? If God is all knowing, why did this happen? Why do children die or get assaulted? What about war, disaster, famine, evil? What about COVID? I'm not saying we can't find answers. But I don't know. All I know is what God has done in my life. Are we missing the miracle? How many have missed a miracle? How many have missed your miracle? Have you seen God intervene in your life? Think about Teresa. And God in her life. Lona, write it. God moved you to come to this church. I know God has worked miracles in Christina's life. I know these work miracles in mine. And I know that people that are watching, many of you will have those to share. I'm not the only one. You have them too. I 
know that in the midst of all my pain and suffering, I've never felt more peace and love and comfort in the midst of all my losses. I have never gained so much. There's so much. Can you explain it? Can you explain the peace I have? Can you explain the joy I have? My thirst for the Bible, my study, my preparations? Can you explain it? The excitement I have to come to church and spend Sunday here? Can you explain the miraculous healing in people? Can you? Explain the deliverance from addiction and bondage? And some people, can you explain it? Where did this message come from? Just sitting there and asking God to help me figure out what to say? Why do people willingly die for this gospel? I can. I can. And I'm not the only one. The answer is Jesus. Say it. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. How do we know that our God is the God? How do we know He's here? Ask a Muslim what Allah has done for them in their life lately. Ask them if they feel love and joy and peace. Ask if they have hope. Ask a Hindu or a New Age specialist about answered prayer in their life. Ask Jehovah Witnesses or Buddhists if they ever get caught up in the presence of God during prayer or worship. They can't, but we can. We can. Because his name is Jesus. That's what I know. That's our miracle. We can tell unending stories of things that he has done for us in our life. You can take away our Bibles. You can. You can take away our churches. You can take away our pastors. You can take away our theology, but you cannot take away the personal things that have personally happened in our lives with our personal God. And that's what we need to know. You can't take it away from us how God is in our lives. The world gives you what is temporary. I know. I was in the world. Never once in my life after a night of drinking or drugging or partying, having sex, spending money, making money, wearing fancy clothes, driving fancy cars, have I ever come home from a night like that and cried tears of joy? Or drop to my knees and cry tears of joy. Never. Never. But I have cried. And so have many of you. Tears of real joy. With no job. No car. No benefits. No money. Legal troubles. Can you explain that? I can. Jesus. I can say his name. It's Jesus. 
Some people are so caught up in knowing that they're missing the miracle. It's right here. What about evolution? What about fossils? What about Earth's time frame? Look. All I know is that I was blind. And now I see. I was dead and now I'm alive. We don't want to stop learning about God. The Bible says that knowledge is linked to life. Colossians 1.10 says, So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Jesus said in Matthew, Truly I say to you, unless you turn to become like children, wanting to learn, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Learning and wanting to know is good. But here's a newsflash for you. Here's a newsflash for you. You will never know God fully. Never. You're never going to know fully. You will never know God fully. He's just too much. The psalm says, His greatness is unsearchable. His understanding is beyond measure. You and I, you and I, we are God's witnesses and there is no greater time to be a witness for Jesus than when you are in a storm. Then when things are bad, when God gets involved, there is no greater witness than the person that stands firm no matter what. And in those cases, what does Jesus say? What did we read in the first verse? What was it that Jesus said? I'm going to read it right from the verse. If I could find the verse. My pages are all messed up. Well, what did Jesus say? Okay. When Jesus seen the man, and he said, in chapter 9, This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. This happened. It happened. We, we get sick. And now God is involved, and so we continue faithful to Him, and what a greater witness. And Jesus says, this happens so the works of God could be displayed in Him now. We've seen it happen when faithful people are sick, and the testimony that they give towards God is amazing. Give glory to God all the way through it. There is no greater witness than that. 1 Peter 3.15 says, In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give. The reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentle, gentleness and respect. So if you want to give a testimony and witness for Jesus, what do you say? I don't know. All I know is that Jesus changed my life. And you share the miracle. That's what you have. The man in John chapter 9 did not search for Jesus. We don't even know his name. Maybe you could pray for others and ask God to get involved in lives of somebody that you know. Or maybe you could be that person. Here's what God is saying. And this, this is what I feel God is saying to us. If you 
we want this church to grow. Really. Then do not feel unworthy. You don't have to have all the answers to give a testimony and give a witness. Our community is full of questions. I know. I've seen them on our site. People are curious. Pray for them. You are the testimony. God's going to use you. I don't know. But what I what I know is that God's Holy Spirit is here. That's all I know. I never asked for this. How does this happen? I never walked through the doors and thought I would be up here. Brothers and sisters, I am humbled to be up here. But I can't say that I haven't seen God's hand in it. From the first time I shook our pastor's hand, and he became my best friend. Others are waiting for this miracle. So I want to open up the invitation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 10, from the International Version says this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your heart. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It's not rocket science. We don't have to have all the answers. I don't know. All I know is that on that day when I accepted Jesus in my life, I felt God's Holy Spirit and I have felt his unseen hand. I don't know what he's got in store for me, but I want to listen to him. I want to say this prayer with you. For those of you that are that are watching and here, uh, I just want to open this invitation up to you because we know that God is real. So if you've thought about accepting Jesus in your life, or if you if you feel that you need to renew your commitment to Jesus, I just want to say a prayer with you. With everybody's eyes closed and heads bowed, let's just pray. And you can repeat this prayer to yourself. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and there's nothing that I can do to save myself. I confess my complete helplessness to forgive my own sin or to work my way to heaven. At this moment, I trust God alone as the one who bore my sin. When he died at the cross, I believe that he did all that will ever be necessary for me to stand in your holy presence. I thank you that Christ was raised from the dead as a guarantee of my own resurrection. As best as I can, I now transfer my trust to him. I am grateful that he has promised to receive me. Despite many sins and failures, Father, I take you at your word. I thank you that I can face death now that you are my Savior. Thank you for the assurance that you will walk with me through the deepest valleys. 
Thank you for hearing this prayer in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, dear God. Amen. And that's our message for today.